In Lyman, Ukrainian teams are trying to make the area safe after Russian troops left landmines behind. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries along with Russia are cutting oil production, prompting backlash from Washington amid soaring energy inflation. North Korea launches its sixth missile in two weeks in response to joint military drills by the U.S. and South Korea in the region. Ukrainian forces are still gaining territory, albeit a little more slowly as they continue their advance in the Kherson region. But the clashes are inflicting heavy damage. After recapturing Lehman, the main Russian bastion in the north of Donetsk province, electricity, water and natural gas services remain cut off. Russian troops have also left dangerous landmines behind. On a road near Lehman, Ukrainian demining teams are trying to make the area safe. In the days after Ukrainian troops pushed Russian forces out of the area, residents are queuing for food and medical aid. It was bad. I couldn't stand the Russian fascists anymore. They brought their flags and everything, but we don't need it. They kept driving down my street in tanks and fuel tankers. I hated it. The Ukrainian police are now back in town, and now we'll rebuild and help people get back to peaceful life. What now? I have no windows. Who hit us? The Russians or our guys? No one was caught red-handed, and now the winter is coming. In Moscow, following Russian President Vladimir Putin's signing of laws ratifying the annexation of four Ukrainian regions, the president has now issued a decree to put the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant under Russian jurisdiction. In the face of its setbacks on the battlefield, Moscow is continuing its mobilization of conscripts. About 200,000 have been signed up and are being sent off for military training. President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly cautioned the West that any attack on Russia could provoke a nuclear response. Some analysts say he's bluffing, but Washington is taking the Russian leader seriously. Here news talk to Nikolai Sokov from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Nuclear weapons actually have more utility when they're not, in fact, used, when you threaten their use. Uh, but once you cross the threshold, uh, the situation changes. Uh, so it would be really best uh, to avoid that situation. And in fact, so far, uh, even though we've seen a lot of nuclear blustering uh, uh, on the side of Moscow, we have not seen any practical steps uh, that might suggest uh, that Russia is preparing uh, to use nuclear weapons. The more likely uh, scenario is a nuclear test, but not in the Black Sea. No, that's uh, quite actually nonsense. Uh, the nuclear test would be at the regular nuclear test site on Nova Zimlia, uh, very much uh, in the north of Russia, big island uh, in the Arctic. The West uh, has to steer a very kind of delicate line uh, between, on the one hand, fully supporting Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, uh, not directly getting involved uh, in the war. Yeah, I would say uh, that Joe Biden, the US President uh, Joe Biden, uh, has actually been doing quite a good job so far. Uh, yes, and I think that we do have a very good actually chance uh, to get through this crisis without uh, seeing nuclear use. It's a diplomatic slap in the face for the U.S. President Joe Biden's administration. OPEC Plus, the international cartel of oil producers, has decided to significantly cut oil production after the White House tried to dissuade its Middle Eastern allies from doing so. This will in turn raise American gasoline prices just five weeks before the U.S. midterm elections. OPEC's decision uh, to cut production's quotas is short-sighted, while the global economy is dealing with the continued negative impact of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. If there's a meaningful price impact of OPEC's decision, it will particularly be on low- and middle-income uh, countries. 
But OPEC members, Saudi Arabia justified the cartel's move as market-driven. You have to be proactive. It is a simple principle that we found ourselves deploying. That deployment had enabled us to maintain a sustainable oil market. The White House has condemned the move as geopolitical. The group of oil production countries, in which the plus sign represents the inclusion of Russia, is well aware the cut will drive up the price of oil, which will then benefit Moscow and its funding for its war in Ukraine. Lev Kamyshev looks through photos in his temporary Istanbul apartment after escaping out of Russia. He decided to leave a day after President Vladimir Putin's call for mobilization. I was scared. I was uh, devastated. I left everything I had. I'm empty inside. This is part of his 26-hour journey to Istanbul. Lev first crossed Kazakhstan by foot because he was too afraid to face Russian authorities at the airport. I just wanted to save my life. Uh, of course, I, I don't think that's fair. I, I think that uh, uh, my government uh, left me no choice. Authorities in Istanbul estimate about 10,000 people from Russia have flown into the city since the mobilization announcement. And in the entire region in Turkey, an official reportedly said 1,800 Russians arrived there within the first few days. Flights to Turkey have often sold out since the conscription call. But it's impossible to know how many are coming to avoid the call-up. Some European Union governments say that such men wouldn't be welcomed in their countries. Lithuania's foreign minister says his country wouldn't grant asylum to what he stated were people simply running from responsibility. He tweeted that they should fight Putin in Russia. The UN's refugee agency told Euronews that people seeking asylum should be supported wherever and whoever they are. If you are staying and you fight, you uh, also can be mobilized, you can be killed in a police department. Lev is hoping to get asylum in Germany. The German government didn't respond to Jonas's request for comment about whether it would grant asylum to men fleeing Russian military service. Yoronu spoke to another Russian man who had fled to Turkey last week. He said he was against the war and he left because he was afraid he'd be forced to fight. He later told Euronews he was too afraid for his interview to be aired, even with his identity hidden. As for Lev, he says he wants to go back to Russia after the war. We want to be those men at the end of the war who didn't shoot. We will return, we will build a new Russia, we will help to rebuild Ukraine. Kristina Chovanovsky, Euronews, Istanbul. North Korea fired two ballistic missiles in Japan's direction, landing into the Pacific Ocean. This is the sixth missile launched by North Korea in under two weeks in response to joint U.S. and South Korean military drills in the region. It came as Pyongyang condemned the U.S. for meeting with the U.N. Security Council to discuss North Korea's recent missile launches, which it justifies as a counteractive measure. We call on all UN member states, especially council members, to join us in condemning this reckless behavior and in urging the DPRK to abandon in a complete, verifiable and irreversible manner its unlawful weapons programs and engage in diplomacy toward denuclearization. But the UN Security Council meeting did not end on an agreement. The US accused China and Russia of enabling North Korea by blocking attempts to strengthen sanctions on Pyongyang. SpaceX sent 52 more of its Starlink internet satellites into orbit. This came a few hours after the company launched astronauts towards the International Space Station for NASA. The Starlink satellites aim to provide global internet access, especially to underserved regions like war-torn Ukraine and areas in southwest Florida devastated by Hurricane Ian.